Welcome to the March edition of the Health Leader Forge. My name is Mark Bonica, and I'm a professor of health management and policy here at the University of New Hampshire. I'm pleased to be joined today by recent UNH graduate, Samir Panasar, who was the guest host for this episode. Welcome back, Samir. Thank you for having me on. Great to have you back. So who did you talk to for this episode? So for this episode, I talked to Dr. Teresa Leverett, who is a family practice physician in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and she's essentially started a, a new model, or not necessarily a new model, but, uh, you know, an emerging model of delivering primary care, which is called direct primary care. So she is self-employed, and she's actually paid uh, directly by her patients. So what did you learn talking to Dr. Leverett? So I was really interested to learn about this emerging model of providing primary care that is, you know, that is really happening in, in a number of areas actually throughout the United States. Dr. Leverett talked in the interview about her dissatisfaction with, with corporate medicine and working for working for a large group practice. She felt as though, you know, she was kind of on a treadmill in terms of how many patients she had to see every day. And she really didn't feel as though she was able to provide the level and the quality of care that she wanted to her patients and, and was quite dis- quite dissatisfied about uh, about that practice environment. So she took a she took, you know, what is today a pretty radical step and, and opened up a direct primary care practice in which she has a smaller patient panel, but she gets to spend more time with each of her patients as well. And uh, as somebody who's not enrolled in a, in a direct primary care practice or doesn't have a DPC position, I, I was interested to, you know, learn about this, uh, about this model that very small uh, percentage of, of primary care physicians are engaged in. So I was uh, really interested to learn about her practice model, you know, how she charges and, and bills patients, uh, how much time she spends with them and, and additional services that she provides that aren't necessarily reimbursable under, say, for example, an insurance company's reimbursement or whether it be a public or a private insurer, things that they may not, you know, reimburse for, such as taking time to explain something to a patient or maybe even providing a phone call. So I was really interested to learn about how practice model she has now, she feels, and, and I think her patients also feel, fits fits her needs better as well as serves the needs uh, and, and wants her of her patients better as well. Yeah, it, it was a really neat interview. I really enjoyed learning about this approach to paying for care and the intimacy that she seems to have with her patients, which is pretty amazing. My experience, and I think, you know, probably yours as well, this, you know, the 15 minute appointment and she's able to do like an hour uh, or more with a patient. Yeah, I think, no, you're absolutely right. And I think the other thing that, that Dr. Leverett also talked about in the interview was, uh, you know, how we have primary care crisis in this country. I mean, it's no, no secret to anybody within healthcare that, you know, primary care physicians are, uh, you know, among like the least compensated physicians. And so, you know, you have a lot of medical students who, you know, flock to high paying specialties. But there's, you know, there's evidence out there to suggest that better primary care could actually imp- improve the quality of care that's delivered and, and maybe even decrease, uh, maybe even decrease costs. And so I, I think that, you know, uh, for medical students who are considering, you know, pursuing a career as a primary care physician, seeing a, seeing an alternative to the 15-minute appointment visit that all of us are so familiar with, I think was, uh, was to me, really exciting. Great. Well, thanks for doing this interview, Samir, and I'm, I'm really excited to share it. So here is Samir Panasar and Dr. Teresa Leverett discussing direct primary care. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Leverett. Thank you, Samir. It's nice to see you. Likewise. Uh, So you went to the State University of New York at Buffalo for college. How did you decide to go there, and and what did you study? I grew up in Rochester, New York, and um, when it came time to decide about college, I graduated high school but didn't quite know what I wanted to do, and I ended up actually working for two years. And I eventually decided that I wanted to go into health care of some type. And uh, the University of Buffalo is, it was an hour away from home, and it's an amazing university. It's an amazing place, and uh, I knew that I would get the experience and the uh, exposure to things that I needed there. I was a psychology major, and... um, as an undergraduate, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with psychology, but that's what I chose to do. And then in addition to all the psychology classes, I there was all the pre-med curriculum. So when I went to college, I went knowing that I was going to go to medical school. That was my goal. 
Um, so after college, you went to medical school at the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. At what point did you decide that you were interested in, in becoming a physician? That was before I even started college. I knew I was looking at other health professions prior to um, University of Buffalo. I was thinking about maybe being a laboratory technologist or um, a physician assistant. And I realized that the curriculum for most of those programs was the same as the pre-med curriculum. And so I figured if I'm going to have to take those classes anyway, I'm just going to become a doctor. And I don't know, I guess that's what happened. <laughs> um, how did you uh, pick the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine? When I was looking at medical schools, I <sighs> felt that even back then, that medicine was going in a direction that was losing its humanistic and holistic approach. Everything was becoming, um, here, take a pill. Here, let's get a test. And I found out about osteopathic medicine from my pre-med advisor at University of Buffalo. And I was never really aware of it. And... Uh, but as I looked at their curriculum, it was all the same curriculum as you would get at a standard, you know, at a regular medical school, at a med MD school. But there was this humanistic, holistic approach that they had as well. Because the philosophy of osteopathic medicine is that we're, we are a whole human being before we are a heart condition or diabetic or any of those things. And so I, I felt that that was the, appropriate place for me to go with my philosophy of what medicine should be. And being a New York State resident, was that's why I ended up there. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, how uh, or when did you know that you wanted to become a family physician? That was different. What happened was when I actually uh, graduated from medical school, I uh, did at that time what they called was a rotating internship. It was it allowed me to become fully licensed as a physician after a year. And from there, I actually started a radiology residency. And I spent about eight months in the shadows uh, looking at black and white pictures. And actually, a lot of what I ended up doing was barium enemas for eight hours at a time. And I just realized that that wasn't me, that I'm not someone that could just sit and look at pictures all day. I needed that human interaction. So my husband was actually stationed in Ohio at the time at a um, federally underserved hospital because uh, he had a um, U.S. Public Health Service scholarship through medical school. And so we were kind of stuck there. And while he finished out his commitment, I thought about what I wanted to do. I worked in urgent cares and I worked in small hospital emergency rooms. Just kept busy with medicine, but hadn't really decided. But then as we got to the end of things, I realized that family practice uh, was really what I was meant to do. Because as much as I lo love the interaction with people in, in the urgent care settings, in the emergency room settings, it wasn't family medicine. It was here, take a pill and go, <laughs> you know, and that was, so it, that's when I decided. Okay. Uh, you completed your residency at the Eastern Maine Medical Center in Bangor. Uh, how and why did you choose uh, EMMC for your residency? Part of my childhood had been spent in Portland, Maine, and my father, who was, he was a dentist, um, who did public health dentistry out of, he was the director of the children's dental clinic, actually, at the uh, Maine Medical Center. And while living there, I fell in love with Maine. I loved living in Maine. I loved living in New England in general. Um, my husband and I were in Ohio for his public health commitment. And my brother, who was still living in Maine, said, you should come to Maine. You've always loved it here. Come to Maine. And then I looked into uh, family medicine residency programs, and at Eastern Maine Medical Center, they had a family medicine residency program 
that um, was a combination of osteopathic students and MD students, and they accepted my rotating internship as my first year of residency. So I was able to go in as a second year resident, a PGY2, it's called, um, for family medicine there. So it was sort of a win-win all around. Plus, they needed an emergency physician in their emergency department, and my husband was looking for a job. So it was a, that's why we ended up there. But I also love the, the rural aspect of it. It was very much a community hospital, even though it was a major medical center. Um, and we had people that would come from Caribou and, you know, all over the state that would come to Eastern Maine Medical Center for their health care. Being a professional, such as a physician, is an important part of an individual's identity. When did you know that you would really internalize this? Uh, so in other words, when did you really feel like you were a physician? And, and what does it mean to be one? When I first thought about that, I thought, well, the day I got my diploma, I knew I was a physician. Uh, and um, I knew what a responsibility it was. I knew what a uh, commitment it was. And I knew what a privilege it was. But it wasn't until I started this practice that I really felt like I was a doctor. And uh, for many reasons, but mostly because before I ever became a doctor, this was what I thought medicine was going to be. And it hadn't been that way at all until I started this. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your career as a practicing physician. Uh, we'll split it into your career uh, prior to opening this practice and, and afterwards. Uh, so after your residency, you worked a number of jobs in emergency medicine, urgent care, and in family practice. Could you tell us a little bit more about this period in your career? What were you trying to do, and were you perhaps trying to find the right practice environment for yourself? After my residency, well, let me just go back just a little bit. Sure. At the tail end of my second year of my family practice residency of a three-year program, I had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of threw uh, a whole different uh, dimension on everything. And it wasn't exactly planned out that way. But um, I had a... <laughs> I had still had another year of residency to complete, and um, that was a difficult year because I had to go to work. I was working 60, 70-hour weeks, and uh, every three nights was a 36-hour, I was doing a 36-hour shift. So after that year, I just thought, you know, I'm going to finish my residency, I'll get my, certif my board certification, but my child's going to come first. I wanted to raise my own child. My husband and I wanted to raise our own child, our own child. So I was lucky to find some a, a very part-time commitment at a, a again another federally underserved area in um, the uh, seacoast of Maine, actually area, and um, and that was fine. But then we realized we were expecting a second child, and it, and it just further made me realize that. As much as I love medicine and being a doctor, my first priority was going to be to my family. And my husband doing emergency medicine meant nights and weekends and a schedule all over the place. So um, my not so much was I trying to find the right practice environment for myself, but I was just maintaining my skills, if you will, while I maintained a household and a home for my family. You worked for Exeter Family Care, which was formerly known as Exeter Family Medicine Associates, for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that experience like? Uh, what did you like and what did you not like about your time as an employed physician there? When I first took that position, we had, we had just moved to the Seacoast area. And when we moved here, it was because my husband's job changed. And emergency medicine has a, um, 
it's a very, very difficult profession. And, and so he decided, he took this position at Exeter Hospital. When we came here, I didn't even actually have a job. And I had approached core physicians and told them that I was family practice and I would like to work, but I would, could only work one to two days a week. And I was told, well, we don't have any role for part-timers here. So I said, okay, fine, I'll find something else. And, and I was approached at a reception by Dr. Carl Singer. And he was at Exeter Family Medical Associates at the time. And he said, we're looking for somebody to come work one or two days a week. And I heard that's all you want to do. Could you, would you like to come work with us? And at the time I said, my decision was based on a lot of the fact that they were still a, an independent group. They weren't hospital owned. And uh, I thought, this is what I wanted anyway. I want to be part of an independent group. I don't want to work for the hospital organization. And so it was a, it was a really great opportunity. But <laughs> two years after starting with them, they sold to core physicians. And I had no say in that decision. They, I wasn't considered a partner in the practice. I was part-time. And I had no say in it. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go go along with it. It's they, At that point, core physician said, we will honor the fact that you started there as a one to two day a week, and we will hold, we'll allow you to stay to that, even though you're the only family practice physician we have in our organization that is doing this. Well, by the end of the time that I was with them, it ended up that um, there are a number of doctors doing it. I wasn't the only one. And uh, so, but as my children got older, um, I started working more hours. And as I started working more hours is when I started realizing that I was extremely unhappy doing that. Um, mostly because I felt that as a physician, we weren't valued. As a matter of fact, I was told on more than one occasion how the organization loses money on family practice physicians unless they can see 25 or more patients a day. And I just thought, I don't want to do this anymore. So I quit medicine altogether. So that's what that experience did for me. It made me realize what I thought at the time was I hated medicine. What I realized now was I hated my job, but I loved medicine. Um, so between the time that um, you stopped working there and between uh, the time that you started this uh, direct primary care practice, what was that time period for you like? What were you trying to uh, maybe figure out or, or work on? At first I thought I would really enjoy just not working. Uh, I didn't enjoy that at all. I taught myself how to reupholster furniture. I got myself this really huge air compressor thing that, you know, shoots staples through concrete if you want it to. And I reupholstered furniture for several months. I went through my house and thought, oh, I'll do this one, I'll do that one. That got old after a while. And I realized that I missed medicine. And I thought if there was any chance that I was going to go back to some kind of job in medicine, I better maintain my skills. I found a job working for Fidelity in Merrimack as the medical director. They have an on-site employee health clinic there. And it's staffed full-time by a nurse practitioner. But um the Mer but Fidelity requires that there be a physician medical director at each site, even though nurse practitioners don't technically need mm -hmm. um, medical oversight. 
So I took that job. That was one day a week. And that was fine because while I was there, I would see patients. And it, it was very nice because uh, because I wasn't working for a hospital organization or an insurance company. I could spend an hour with people. And it was fine. It was expected. Uh, and then I um, realized that that wasn't doing it for me either. I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't doing it for me. So I started thinking about how can I do this on my own terms? And I Googled concierge medicine because it was something that people had said to me, you should look into it. Or, and when I Googled concierge medicine, I started looking at that thinking, this is just the same stuff. You're just working for... A, another organization. Most concierge physicians don't aren't actually self-employed. They're working for some other big corporate organization. And then I came across direct primary care. And direct primary care uh, is endorsed by the American Academy of Family Physicians. And so they actually do biannual conferences on direct primary care. And that's when I went to my first conference on this and I, I walked into the room, and <laughs> everybody was happy. And to go to a medical conference and see physicians actually happy and interacting and talking and was so unusual to me because usually you go to a medical conference and everybody is sitting at their desk with their head down, staring at their tablets, not talking to anybody else, visibly not happy. And this was the strangest experience I'd ever had. So that was my first experience with it. Um, that got the ball rolling for me. So let's delve a little bit into um, this period in your career uh, in regards to starting this practice. So in 2015, you founded Freedom Family Practice, which is a direct primary care solo physician practice in Portsmouth. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what a direct primary care practice is like? Um, we know that you don't take any insurance and are instead uh, paid directly by your patients. Um, could you elaborate and tell us a little bit more about, about what this practice is like? Absolutely. Um, the The business model of this is very similar to a health club in that you pay an enrollment fee, then there's a monthly membership fee. The monthly membership fee includes your visits. It, whenever you come here, there's no copay, there's no charge for an office visit. And the insurance, though, does come into play because uh, if a patient has insurance, it is used to cover anything that's done outside of the office, like an x-ray, lab work that's that I send out, um, seeing a specialist. Any of those things are covered by their insurance. The only thing they can't bill to their insurance is the monthly membership fee. The thing that, that is the most unique about direct primary care is the direct access to me. And I think that this kind of surprises people a lot. This morning, um, I had my phone ring at 7.30 this morning, and I answered the phone, and, oh, oh, I was expecting to get a machine. It's the usual, the usual response. And, and, or, oh, is there, is there another number I should be calling for your office? Um, and that people don't realize that that actually is possible. And that's what this is the most unique about direct primary care. A lot of what I do is over the phone. I think that it's been shown that this is why telemedicine is, is so booming as another alternative. It's been shown that um, a lot of what is done in healthcare could be done and not actually be in the same room. So, but, and, but I know my patients. I know them when they call. I know what their health problems are. I know what medications they're on. So a lot of things being handled over the phone is is uh, to help streamline things for them and for me. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, about the patients you see? Uh, what is your patient panel size like? Uh, are you typically seeing uh, one type of patient, whether they be older or younger? Are you seeing more self-employed patients or patients that are uh, that are employed? Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, right now, my patient panel size is just a little over two hundred. 
I have all of the above. Uh, I was. It's kind of surprising to me to see what types of people are actually interested in in this type of experience with a physician. The, uh, the, the main underlying theme is they all want the same thing. They all want to be able to have a relationship with their doctor. They don't want their doctor to sit and stare at a computer. They don't want to have to go through a phone tree and then leave several messages before somebody gets back to them. They don't want to have to wait three and a half months for an appointment, which I think that was, that was good when I called for myself to get in with a new provider for a new patient physical three and a half months was the best I could find. So people, um, they're so, but they're all different ages. I have, uh, children, families, men, women, um, employed, unemployed, insured, uninsured, medic, Medicare. I have a lot of Medicare patients. No Medicaid because state Medicaid is a whole different, uh, unfortunately, um, that's a whole different process. But I have patients with Medicare that are willing to pay my monthly membership because they've gotten so frustrated with the system the way it is. So they come from all over and I keep my membership at an affordable rate so that uh, people that are uh, unemployed can afford it. And um, I don't know if you went on to my website to see what my monthly fa- fees are, but it's it's $59 a month, which is about $2 a day. And most people think that, figure that, well, you know, maybe I can't go to Starbucks every day and that'll be it. <laughs> that'll cover it. Could you speak a little bit to um, your practice's involvement with uh, or interactions with small businesses, uh, which have significantly or, or which have faced uh, significant challenges in regards to purchasing uh, affordable health insurance for their employees? Yes, this has become a, a, a huge market, if you will, for direct primary care practices in general. Small companies can't afford to pot, buy health insurance for their employees that as, uh, and if they, but if they, and they've had to work around that in so many different ways, like, uh, making people part time or laying people off after sort of period of time and then rehiring or, um, and they have the same mandate that, that the general population does though, that, well, which has actually been changed just recently, and you would probably know more about that being a health policy analyst. That, uh, But um, there are now ways for small companies to um, get pooled in a cooperative way to be self-funded, which is uh, what larger companies can do. In other words, the self-funding means that if there's a catastrophic illness in one of their employees, they cover that above and beyond what's um, available through their health insurance. And by using direct primary care for their employees for their primary care, and then being co-opt with other companies to get their major medical, Mm -hmm. they can save up to 35% on their healthcare costs. And if you're a bottom line person running a small business, and I can tell you, (laughs) I truly appreciate that now myself. I never did before I did this, but you, that's a big savings. Not only that, but um, it's been shown in this, there've been direct primary care has been around long enough and it's been working with small companies long enough that it's been shown that the uh, time off from work is greatly reduced the um, the fact that employees can actually get in with the doctor when they need to be seen, they get back to work sooner, they are healthier because they have a better relationship. It's basically it is it is when you have a relationship with a doctor and they know you and they spend over an hour with you when you show up for your wellness exam, you're going to be a healthier person. 
And I have had uh, an, a wonderful relationship with my uh, the first small business that I um, now work with. I don't know if I can say the name of it. Can I say the name of it? Uh, Terracotta Pasta, who is a small business. He's a small business um, out of Dover, New Hampshire. And he has, his employees to him are family. And he wanted them to be able to get health care, but was the bottom line was he was really being stretched with the cost. And now it's been wonderful. He, and I, I, and when I say it's family to him, he, I truly believe that. And I think that most small businesses feel that way about their employees. So, um, I, as a direct primary care, I can save the company money. I can improve the quality of life for their employees and improve their health care. Keep them out of the urgent cares. Keep them out of the emergency rooms because a lot of them end up doing that for their health care, which is the terrible way to manage things. The episodic crisis con- control. It doesn't work that way. Maybe ask a little more about, you're talking about a lot about access. Mm-hmm. And so maybe let's explore that a little bit. Like some of, like, how do, you, how do you go about helping them do that? So maybe you can ask a little more along those lines. So, you know, um, uh, in terms of phone calls or whatever it is that you're, that enables you. So why don't you ask about that? And I'm going to clip all that out. <laughs> okay. So uh, being a direct primary care uh, practice, um, you're able to do things that, uh, you know, traditionally uh, payers and insurers wouldn't necessarily reimburse for, whether it be talking to patients over the phone or uh, non-visit based care. Uh, could you speak a little bit about how you uh, find in this practice that you are more accessible to your patients and, and what impact that has on um, both actually on, on your, uh, you know, working day as well as uh, as well as your patients as well, which may have uh, you know other concerns or other priorities in their day too. My uh, my uh, access is through um, not just office visits, but uh, cell phone. I give my cell phone number to my patients, um, email, um, private messaging through the electronic medical record that I use, uh, Skype. Um, <laughs> I. I'm available to my patients and um, that the, I have patients that live in uh, California, Michigan, um, patients that move to Florida for months at a time. And it's, it's not an issue because I can, we manage from those, those areas. It's not, I, as long I tell my patients, as long as I see you once a year, and just because I like to still be in the room with people and breathe the same air they breathe, because it tells me a lot about a person when I do that. Uh, but as long as I see them once a year, we can manage everything else, however it needs to be done. And there's all kinds of uh, encrypted, HIPAA secure ways of communicating now. Um, it's because it is such a growing field. Uh, and then typically, as far as access is concerned, I have people call me up and say, my wife checked my blood pressure because she said I looked like my face was turning purple and it's over 200 and I don't have a doctor. And I will see that person the same day as a new patient. And there's no place you can go like that anymore. There just isn't. And But in the meantime, there are people that need to be able to get in with a doctor. So I'm always, I try to, what ends up happening too a lot of times is that one person in a family will sign up with me and they'll say, gee, you know, I want my wife or my kids to have the same experience, so I'm going to sign them up with you too. So I have family plans. Uh, so in terms of your uh, patient panel, uh, is 200 patients about where you want it to be? or No. Um, right now, it, <laughs> I'm stretched really thin. I'm um, Because when I first started the practice, I was able to do it all myself. And it, it, was, a, it was a learning experience because, um, and we didn't really talk about this ter- a lot yet, but... Or, but just to back up a little bit, I did 
Uh, besides going to that first conference on direct primary care, I went to a second conference on direct primary care. Um, I went to a free market medical association. Um, I went to an American Academy of Private Physicians conference. I went to a lot of conferences mm-hmm. since I had free time in between reupholstering furniture and <laughs> and doing the health and wellness thing. But um, and then I also um, hired a consultant, and uh, uh, his name is Dr. Brian Forrest. He is. Uh, he has been doing direct primary care in um, North Carolina for, well, now it's going to be, it would be like 17, 18 years that he's been doing it. And he does what he calls his one-day boot camp. And I went down there, and um, my daughter came with me because she was going to initially help me set up my practice as far as the business side of things. She had been a recent grad of the Paul School. So she knew something about some things about business. She uh, so we went down there, spent a day there, learned all there was to know about doing this. We came back up. I set up my practice, and something happened when I hit about eighty-five patients. It just suddenly became busier and more complex and more complicated, and I started to feel like. I wasn't as available to my patients as I had been when it was just 35 patients, you know? And um, so that's when I called Lisa and I got her in here and she started um, working with me. I feel that realistically I could probably at five to 600 patients is where I would want to max out, but I would need to hire somebody full time. Um, Brian Forrest has 1,200 patients and manages very well and still manages to see uh, six to eight patients a day and spend an hour with his patients. Um, But that's because he has been doing it a long time and he has the most amazing medical assistant working for him that does, she's just amazing and she's been with him all along. So that would be my Absolute maximum would probably be around five to six hundred. Um, could you uh, just talk a little bit about who Lisa is, since uh, we hadn't talked about that a little bit? Lisa Chase is an RN who um, I had worked with at Core Physicians for almost ten years, and she had um, become frustrated with corporate medicine pretty much the same time I did and had actually resigned just shortly before I did. And when things started getting busy for me, I actually had, and this is another thing that we'll talk about is, is having students working with me, but I had a, a nurse practitioner student from the UNH program um, spending a rotation with me who happens to be Lisa's daughter. And she, she said to me, you, this is just you're you're getting crazy busy. You really need some help. You should call mom. She's not doing anything. This is what she, that's kind of that's the perception we all have about our parents, right? It's like what do you do all day when you're retired, right? But so I called Lisa and she said, yeah, she'll come and help as much as she can, but it's not full time. But she's wonderful. She and I, uh, because we had worked together for so long. She can finish my sentences for me, type thing. So, is Lisa your only employee? She is right now. I had um, a, a young woman working with me who um, had no medical experience, but she again had been a recent grad from UNH, but she was a math major. Uh, so, she's a brilliant young woman, and she was a good friend of my daughter's. That's how I found out about her. But she recently took a job. But the job didn't work out, so now I'm hoping I can get her back here. She was able to do pretty much everything except for draw blood. That was one thing that I didn't feel she would be ready to do as a non-medical person. But she she would take care of all the other things that a, a medical assistant would. 
Um, so certainly starting a, a direct primary care practice in which you're self-employed is, uh, is, does not fit within the majority of, of physicians today who are not self-employed. Uh, could you talk about what has been the hardest thing about starting your practice? What has surprised you? Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Yes. When I, um, whenever you start a small, any business of any kind, and you read business starting for dummies or whatever, you know, 101, they always say the first thing you need to do is have a, a business plan. And I had absolutely no experience with business. There is still to this day, as far as I know, there isn't a medical school in this country that has how to start your own practice as part of their curriculum. And I had no role models of any physician other than people that I had met at these direct primary care conferences. So that was probably, that was really difficult for me to think of myself as a business owner, as a practice owner. I had to take two steps forward and sometimes three steps back. I... I joke that my best consultant was my hairdresser because she had owned her own business for over 20 years and knew about business plans and about how no matter what your plans are, you have to have a plan B because plan A rarely really works out. And she taught me a lot about just little things about how to um, set up uh, email lists for your, you know, people and, um, how to deal with contractors and how to, she just told me a lot of her own personal experience. Um, but the hardest part was definitely doing that. Um, one of my biggest fears and it almost completely, convinced me not to do this, but one of my biggest fears was the whole insurance industry side of things, because there actually had been a physician in the state of New Hampshire who had started the transition process of an insurance-based practice to a direct primary care membership-based practice, and she ended up um, losing her, um, she ended up getting sanctioned by the state medical society and losing her practice in moving to Vermont. Now, there are people that told me about this before I even started the practice. So I had approached um, someone, in the st I had approached the state insurance commissioner who happened to be uh, a good friend of my neighbor, and that's how <laughs> they go to the same church. You know, New Hampshire is a small state. So she said, oh, you should talk with Roger Savini. He's the state insurance commissioner. And he, he and I, you know, we're on these church projects together. So I know him really well. I'll tell him, I'll tell him about you. So I went and I met with Roger Savini and, and, um, and then uh, Tyler Brandon, who is the state health policy analyst, was in on these meetings. And, and I, I just said, you know, I'm thinking about starting this practice. And this is my business model. And in some, mo there are some states in this, the country now that have passed legislation that have said direct primary care is not insurance. It's a private contract between physicians and patients. And therefore, as it, since it is not insurance, it cannot be held to insurance laws. And a lot of states have enacted this type of legislation just to protect the direct primary care practices from being challenged, if you will, by insurance companies. And um, so Tyler Brandon was really, really helpful. He's very knowledgeable. And uh, he was very knowledgeable about the state insurance laws. And he said that while there is no law against it, there's no law supporting it or protecting it. So he had encouraged me to maybe pursue passing legislation in the state of New Hampshire as well, which I started to do. And I was I was through to the process of the bill was going to be um, heard, um, reviewed by the State Commerce Committee. It was to that process. And um, I um, decided at that point that 
I was, I don't know, I guess I could say I was afraid to pursue it anymore. I didn't feel secure enough. I didn't have, because the Commerce Committee, from my understanding, is they want to know how is this going to benefit consumers? And I had no consumers because I hadn't started my practice. So I was going to go there and I, and I knew insurance lobbyists would show up because they wanted to know what was going on with this. And I would, I would have no support. So, um, the, um, I decided then not to pursue it. But at this point, I'm, I'm so busy. <laughs> I, I could pick up the ball and start running it with it again, but I'm not sure that I have the, biz- the time. And now I can't remember what the question was. I, I digressed a bit. No, that's fine. I, th- no, I think you certainly answered it. But I think you would also have a lot more, uh, you know, consumer support and, and benefit to show for At it. At this now. point, I yeah. have a lot more consumer support. Um, so, but that was probably, oh, I know, the question was, was why, uh, what were some of your biggest obstacles? And that was my biggest fear, was that I would put my heart and soul into this. And then someone would come along and say, you can't do this. So, um so far, I haven't been challenged, thank God. Um, and I think as long as I remain kind of a small mom and pop thing, I don't really threaten any business for that matter. And I don't ever encourage people to not have insurance. I always encourage them to have it or something to uh, protect them if they should have a major medical issue. That was my biggest obstacle, my biggest fear. Okay. That and just learning how to run a small business. Mm. I had no idea. <laughs> did not did not come up in medical school. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. And then this whole business of uh, now just just going from uh, a one person organization to hiring a person, mm-hmm. just hiring one employee. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, that's a whole nother thing I have to learn about and. So, yeah. Uh, For other physicians, um, especially among the primary care specialties of family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, do you think that this uh, practice model is best suited towards one of those specialties or pretty equal amongst them? Direct primary care has been shown to be um, excellent for all of those primary care practices, but as it turns out, there are like there are a number of specialists in the country that are actually starting direct primary care like pra- membership based practices. Specialists like uh, endocrinologists, um, uh, pain medicine specialists, even orthopedics. It, it's, it's growing in many different specialties, which when I thought about that, I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting, but it makes sense. That, that that would be uh, the, the next way for it to grow. Could you speak a little bit as to why you think this uh, moving in this kind of direction is, is making sense for, uh, for patients uh, and or physicians? Direct primary care or direct care in general has put it back in the world of the doctor with the patient. And, um, and, and I shouldn't just say doctor because, uh, there are nurse practitioners that are doing it now too. Um, and anyone that has an independent license can, can do direct, direct care. It, it makes so much more sense that I work for no one but my patients. And that's it. Uh, you know, I still have to pay the IRS and, you know, do all that other stuff. But I did, I only work for my patients. And I truly feel that direct care makes that relationship so important that I really think of these, my patients as those people in the world that I'm responsible for. For and and have to help them maintain their health. 
So you've elaborated, uh, you've talked about this to some extent, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, about your practice model being kind of a quote unquote back to the future solution to the problems in healthcare. Uh, for instance, uh, not only can your patients access you in a variety of different methods, but you also offer house calls for a fixed fee as well. Um, can you talk about how having a single doctor throughout the continuum of someone's care can be beneficial for both the patient as well as the doctor? One of the things, one of the uh, aspects of my family medicine residency was that when we um, did 36 hour shifts, it was um, the, the reasoning behind that was the continuity of care. And as it turns out now, there's really very few programs that, I guess most states actually have laws against it now because they found that when someone's been up 36 hours, they're not making good medical decisions, especially if there's someone that is relatively inexperienced in their medical training. So, but that's what it's, that's the benefit. It's the continuity of care. I send people to specialists when they need them, but I still end up having to coordinate with that specialist. Mm -hmm. um, and there's 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 a um, comfort factor, I guess, if you will. That's it's immediately comforting to people to know that if they pick up the phone and call me, that I'm going to answer, mm -hmm. um, because they're not calling me to bother me. They're calling me because they have a concern. They're worried about something or. They need something that, that I can provide for them. And um, I recently, um, it is a, a mid-20th, it is going back to the future, um, and it is a, um, I wouldn't say it's a live-to-work thing, but it's a live-to-have-a-fulfilling-profession thing. And... One of the things that I recently had an experience with was um, last February, I went to the New Hampshire Academy of Family Physicians Midwinter Conference at um, the White Mountain Inn or whatever it's called. In any case, I went to the New Hampshire Midwinter Conference. And this was, a, again, a room full of family physicians. And you walk in. And everyone is sitting at their desk, staring down at their stuff. And nobody was talking to each other. And I mean, there might have been one or two people in the far corners, but people were just there. And, uh, and even at the, um, the dinners, you know, the meals, there were large tables where eight people would sit at a table. And even at the tables, people weren't really engaged with each other. They were only talking with people that they knew. And um, so I started telling people about me, about myself and what I do. And they, the response is interesting. Um, it's almost universal. And I, I guess I was guilty of it myself at first too, was that they, they said to me, you mean you're on call 24-7, 365 for your patients? And I said, yeah. Oh, I could never do that. This is always the response. I could never do that. That would make me crazy. I said, well, what's interesting is that I can't tell you if I've ever gotten a call after 10 o'clock at night. I don't, I haven't. I haven't gotten a call after 10 o'clock at night. And when my patients call me, I know them. And it's a 90 second conversation. It's not like when I was working for core physicians and I was covering 20 practices when I was on call. And if somebody called me, I had no idea who they were. So it's the continuity of care and the lifestyle that I have now. It's quite honestly, I've gone out of town on vacation and I still cover my practice because, because I know my patients and I can. So, so you're in about year three of this practice now. Uh, what are some of your uh, goals or opportunities or kind of new developments that you'd like to have in your practice moving forward? Well, 
one of my original goals for doing this in the first place was to show my colleagues who are all bailing, jumping ship like rats off of a sinking ship into, you know, going to work for pharmaceutical companies, going to work for insurance companies, going to work for, you know, hospital organizations. I wanted to show my colleagues that they could actually be happily a doctor again, and they didn't have to give it up. So that was my goal was to show that it could be done. And my goal now is to uh, grow to about that five to 600 patient level and bring in a partner, bring in a colleague. And that's why I have as much space as I have here was because I always knew that, well, I always hoped that I would grow. (laughs) One of the things I would like to do is work with medical students on is how to start your own practice, what's involved from the business side of it, because I know they're not getting that curriculum. Um, I think that there's plenty of opportunities for clinical stuff, and they don't really need to see my patients, per se, but to see how to start this, what what is involved from day one, uh, you know, before you even open your doors. What supplies do you need, and what billing system do you use, and what electronic medical record system do you use? All these things, and it's a uh, that to me is uh, another big goal of mine is to get students in for that aspect of it, and then again, like I said, getting in a, a partner, hopefully someone on the younger side, because um, my goal was to maybe do this until I reach retirement age, which is not that far off, really. So. (laughs) I'd like to um, take that last aspect of that question and kind of open it up a little bit more to some of the, um, you know, broader, like, challenges in in medicine and actually particularly in primary care. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on kind of the the primary care crisis in this country. Uh, It's really no secret to anybody who's familiar with this that uh, primary care physicians um, have faced very challenging working conditions and are certainly on the lower end of uh, of compensation and reimbursement um, from both uh, public as well as private insurers. Uh, What do you think that you're direct primary care practice can show to um, other people or other stakeholders uh, in primary care, as well as uh, especially medical students who might be considering a a career in primary care, which is uh, interest that has been uh, on a downtrend for quite some time. The there it's, it's tragic. It's, it's definitely, it's tragic to me um, what's happened in primary care. And I, 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 I just, I feel horrible. I, I can't tell you, just the fact that docs can't spend time with their patients. When I was with CORE, I was told that I could have 30 minutes for a physical and 15 minutes for a follow-up. And I was also told that if, that all my patients were going to get a survey after they saw me and that if I got behind, I would get bad remarks on my surveys. And um, so you, there's medicine has turned into that, and it's, it's just, just tragic because in the meantime, I'm getting new patients here, and the first time I ever meet them, I'll find a lump somewhere, and it'll be cancer. And they'll say, wow, my doctor never checked that. And I just think it's tragic, the stuff that's being missed, the stuff that's being overlooked, the stuff that's being made the priority, which is checking off boxes so that you can submit your claims and get reimbursed. And the, what was the... Sorry, was that last one right there? I just kind of tried to take it in a different direction. Oh, yeah, 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 tell, yeah, tell. So the message I would tell other... But people thinking about going into primary care is that, yes, it's been way undervalued for way too long. We've been seen as the gatekeepers. Um, like I said, I had my experience recently with a new primary care provider because my previous one had left. <laughs> and um, 
she ended up sending me to two specialists for referrals, and that was it. See you later. <laughs> okay. It's like, okay. So, and, and this is what we do. This is what she does. She's, she's just a gatekeeper. And, um, uh, I think that one of our, one of the things that bothers me the most about what's going on in the business of medicine right now is that these words, healthcare keeps getting tossed around but it's really not health care. They're talking about health insurance, health coverage. Health care is what I do. And health care that's being batted around is not health care at all. And everyone is so programmed to think that if you have, you have to have health insurance to have health care. And I would like for the two things to be thought of separately. And I wish that that would happen. Um, but that's not up to me because I'm not the policy person. I don't establish policies. And uh, But I would like to tell people that want to go into primary care that you can have a very successful practice uh, and you can have a very rewarding professional experience all at the same time. You just have to be willing to take some risks. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that. And I can understand that. Not everybody is a risk taker. Not everybody is uh, willing to do that. But unfortunately, too, the other aspect, the whole other aspect of, of all this is the cost of medical education. People coming out of medical school are looking at, okay, I could go to primary care and I could, you know, I could make enough to, you know, pay back my student loans and maybe, you know, have a small home or whatever. But, or I could go into orthopedic surgery and make a million dollars a year. So what should I do? And that's the, what a lot of people are looking at. Unfortunately. A final question for you. Uh, at the beginning, you talked about how you really felt like you were a physician uh, when you opened up this practice. What did you mean by that? I meant that I had, I guess, an ideal of what a doctor was just from childhood even, you know, my own experience with my own doctor as a child growing up, TV shows that I watched as a kid, Marcus Welby, MD, and just my concept of what a doctor is, is was that ideal. And working for an organization ended up being no different, no less perfunctory to me than what I did out of high school for two years while I was deciding what I wanted to do for my the rest of my life. It was still, it was just the same thing. Um, I was, I was a cog in a wheel. I had a role to play, um, but um, it wasn't, There's a, I think that it's just such an um, important relationship to have with, with people. And um, I didn't have that. And Lisa can tell you too, the, the nurse that's worked with me over the years, she saw how it, it all just deteriorated too. And, um, but now, it's, it's truly what I do, and I truly feel that this is my moment. Well, Dr. Lovett, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and, uh, and tell us about your, uh, your journey. Well, you're very welcome, and I'm, I love to talk about it 
as you can tell. And I'm happy to talk with anyone or um, communicate with anybody that has questions for me because it's uh, uh, that I, one of the things that I learned to before I started this business was um, everyone said that if you start a business, it's going to be your whole life. So you better love it. And I truly do feel passionate about this. And so that's what I want people to see. And I want people to know that they can feel passionate about it as well. So I'm always happy to help. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.